I asked an art A to imagine my killer's face. My killer's face. As soon as I typed the words into the prompt, I knew I shouldn't have. After all, there's already something eerie about art generating AIs. Those intricately detailed landscapes that always seem to have something desolate and apocalyptic about them. Those uncanny images that feel like photos of real people but aren't. The disturbing little details that make you wonder, is this what a computer thinks of us? The clock on my screen read 12 1 a.m. The image my words had generated was still processing, but I'd already noticed something strange about it. Normally, the prompt provided four images, each one slightly different from the others. But all four faces on my screen were the same. Not only that, but as the images became clearer, I saw none of the telltale giveaways of AI art. There were no twisted fingers, no mismatched eyes, or odd pools of light. Just the photorealistic face of the same man, repeated four times. He looked to be in his thirties, with brown undercut hair that stuck to his pasty white forehead. His mouth was twisted into a sneer, like he was about to laugh at a nasty joke. In every image, he wore the same stained white t-shirt and bomber jacket, leaned on the same formica table in the same dirty kitchen, and held the same perfectly rendered can of light beer. His beady hazel eyes seemed to be looking right at me. I felt a sudden impulse to delete the image, block the AI, and throw my laptop out the window. It was almost 12.30. How long had I been staring at that ominous, eerily realistic face? I ran another image as a test. My future lover. The shadowy, disproportionate figures and generic faces the prompt returned were about what I'd expected, but nothing like the four identical images above. No other combination of words gave a similar result. It was a fluke, I told myself. An error in the AI software, it had to be. Because if not, I walked alone down the concrete ramp of the parking garage. My footsteps echoed in the darkness. I'd gone down two levels already, and I still couldn't find where I'd parked. I saw the glow of an emergency exit and suddenly wanted to take it. There was something about the endless rows of silent cars that I didn't like at all. Something ominous and predatory about their sleek metal shades. I turned around a concrete column, and he was there. The bomber jacket. The greasy brown hair. That cruel smirk. I didn't even have time to gasp before the hunting knife flashed in his hand, plunging into my chest again and again. I jolted awake in a puddle of sweat. I staggered to the bathroom and poured cold water down my throat. How could a single image affect me so much? On impulse, I flipped open my laptop to take another look. That eerily detailed was gone, replaced by an error message. No matter what I tried, I couldn't recover it. I bent over the glowing blue screen and typed. What is my killer doing now? The result was just four blurry blue-black squares. At first I was disappointed, but when I leaned in closer, a shape began to take form in the gloomy darkness. A mattress on a trailer floor, a sleeping figure spread out on top of it, a figure that I recognized. This image lasted longer than the first, but soon it too blurred and was replaced by an error message. When I contacted the Art Eyes customer support team, they were as confused as I was. They had no record of the prompts or images I described ever being created. I waited impatiently for the morning to try again. My killer is seen from above, I typed. All four images were of a brown-haired man frying eggs in a tiny kitchen. He was looking upward in irritation looking at me. I slammed the screen of my laptop shut. I was late for work. Throughout the day, I kept wondering about the brown-haired man, my killer. The thought sent a shiver up my spine. Whenever I could, I slipped away to send new prompts to the art eye. Asterisk my killer's home, as seen from the street, my killer's driver's license, my killer's current location. Asterisk, but each time I return more disappointed than the last. I only received distorted generic images, the man with the brown hair was gone. There was a trick, a pattern I needed to follow, but it took me hours and hundreds of images to figure it out. I couldn't find the brown-haired man, 
unless I asked the art eye for him specifically. Searching for information about him got me nowhere. Still, I managed to learn a few details about Ronnie over the course of the day. Or at least Ronnie was the name on his mechanic jumpsuit when I asked for full body image of my killer now. The prompt my killer as seen from a distance also gave me some insight into his car and house. The images were never detailed enough to provide a plate number or address, but I did get a lot of views of a service station along a busy road, a tan car interior filled with fast food wrappers, and a trailer with a redwood deck. In every image, Ronnie was staring angrily at the point from which the image had been generated. Gotcha, his hostile eyes seemed to say. I know you're watching. I wish I could say that fear for my own life was the only reason I continued to spy on Ronnie. The truth was that being able to peer into Ronnie's life at any time had given me a level of access to another person's inner world that I'd never experienced before. I wasn't exactly popular at work, and even back in high school, I was never the friend who people poured their hearts out to. But there were no secrets between Ronnie and I. I knew what Ronnie looked at on his phone as he sat on the toilet in the morning. I knew his girlfriend Katie's favorite sexual physician and preferred brand of nail polish. I knew about their arguments over not being able to conceive a child, about how Ronnie would sit and stare at the refrigerator for several minutes after he called his aging parents, about how he cut corners at work in hopes of a raise. All of the nasty, shameful little details that people hide from one another were laid bare by our connection, and I couldn't find the strength to look away. Even when my spying started to have consequences for Ronnie, I don't think Ronnie knew exactly what was going on, but it was clear that it was affecting him. He started spending more and more time alone in the dark. He looked worn and haggard, as though my late-night observations had somehow jolted him out of sleep. He was starting to look like a killer. I wasn't exactly doing well myself. If I didn't check on Runny several times each hour, I'd break out in a cold sweat, sure that I'd missed the vital moment. As the image processed, I'd bite my lip, sure that when the blurry background cleared I'd see Ronnie walking up my driveway or into my workplace with that glinting hunting knife in hand, ready to keep our appointment with fate. Before long, I was willing to try anything as long as it meant I could get away from my guilt and fear for just a little while. That's how I wound up in the passenger seat of the battered car of a friend of a cousin of one of my workmates, doing a line of coke off of a broken mirror. Flashing red and blue lights appeared behind us after I'd handed her the $20 bill, but before she'd finished unzipping my jeans, shoved into the back of the patrol car, I should have been brooding over the awful turn my life had suddenly taken, or panicking about what would happen when I didn't show up for work in the morning. But all I could think about was the art eye. Whatever Ronnie was up to, I was missing it. The whole experience of being processed passed like a dream. But as I was being led to my holding cell, the harsh laughter of two officers brought me back to reality. You sure it's okay to leave that psycho in with the others? The younger cop asked. I mean, when we picked him up he was screaming about invisible people watching him. Look, his older colleague rested her hands on her belt. If we gave all the crazies their own cell, there'd be no room for anybody else. And look, she grinned at me with a wolfish smile. He's already got a roommate. I already knew who I'd see waiting for me when I rounded the corner of the cell block. Ronnie looked worse than ever. His skin was pasty, his face unshaven. He sat on the cold concrete floor, holding himself, his wild eyes darting around the corner of the ceiling, searching for his invisible observer. When Ronnie saw me, his jaw dropped. You, he snarled. I backed up involuntarily and felt the hard plastic of a nightstick pressing into my back. Get in there, the older cop grunted. When I grabbed the bars instinctively, she pressed harder. Stop resisting. Wait. I was practically whimpering. Is there another cell I can go to? Can't I have a different cell? Officer, I. Stop. Resisting. Pain exploded in my shoulder as the officer brought her nightstick down on my arm. My hand went limp on the bars and I felt myself shoved into the cell. Ronnie's shadow fell across me as he stood up. The cell door slammed shut behind me. Wait, 
I grabbed the bars, screaming as the older officer sauntered down the hallway, whistling cheerfully and ignoring my panicked cries on purpose. Ronnie's bonny fingers grabbed my shoulders from behind and spun me around. Our faces were just inches apart. Why are you following me? Ronnie slammed me against the bars again and again. Who are you? What do you want? I had high. With Ronnie's forearm pressing my throat shut, I couldn't answer him. I couldn't even get enough air to breathe. Black spots flashed in front of my vision. Jesus. I heard a voice say from what felt like very far away. He's killing him. Suddenly hands were pulling us apart, dragging me backwards across the cold, slick floor. Grunts and dull thuds from inside the cell told me that Ronnie was being beaten into submission. Leaving me alone was the last thing I heard him scream before I was led away. After I was released on bail, I did my best to do as Ronnie asked. After all, I'd been at least partially responsible for his incarceration. If I was him, I realized, I'd want to murder me too. The black mirror of my laptop screen seemed to call to me. Just one peek, it seemed to say, what's the harm? He probably won't even notice. Guiltily, I opened the art AI and typed the prompt. My killer is seen from a hidden place. As the image processed, I realized I was seeing a room through the grate of a ceiling vent, a padded room. Words were written on the floor in something brownish red, although whether blood or feces, I couldn't tell. No, I can see you too. Ronnie was staring straight up at the vent with his teeth bared in a lunatic grin. Once per day, I told myself, just to make sure he's still locked up. And once per day, I saw the slow change in Ronnie. He'd stopped staring at the ceiling, stopped writing messages on the floor. His hair was growing out. He did push-ups, read books from the institution library, talked to his doctors. Did he no longer notice my spotting? Or was he just hiding his rage long enough to be released? I had a bad feeling I knew the answer. A few minutes ago, the prompt my killer as seen from a hidden place didn't show a padded cell in some institution. It showed a view of my own neighborhood, with a tiny figure walking closer along the deserted sidewalk. Ronnie must have been released early in the morning, and with my arrest record, he probably had no trouble finding my address. Understanding always comes too late. I created this whole situation myself. There never could have been any other outcome. I've spent a long time sitting here in the dark, trying to think of a way out of this, but it doesn't matter. My fate was decided the moment I asked an AI to imagine my killer's face. Even if I tried to leave the house, get a weapon, or call for help, I know that I would end in the same place, beneath the point of Ronnie's knife. I've locked the doors and windows, but it won't help. I can already see my patio door in the image processing on the screen. He's here.